Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. I always feel like I should apologize for whoever's on the video. <laughs> hey, if, in case you didn't understand, they said that there's no Sunday school for the next two Sundays. Not today. There is Sunday school today. Can everybody say yes? yes. There is Sunday school today. All right, so find a good class. But the next two Sundays, it's Christmas Day next Sunday. It's New Year's Day the following Sunday. We don't have enough teachers to staff that on those holiday Sundays, so there won't be the next coming two Sundays, but today there is Sunday school. So I want to clear that up in case you didn't understand that like me. Um, let, me let me make a couple of our other quick announcements. One is we have a coffee shop in the uh, new part of our building now, and uh, they have started serving coffee, especially coffees out of there. And uh, those are for purchase. But I want you to know that all, all, all of the income from coffee at that coffee shop goes to Speed the Light. So when you pay $3 for a coffee, all of that goes to Speed the Light. Does that make sense? So we're excited. We're excited for that. If you say, I, I, I'd like, you like those, but there's a limited, it's a limited menu. And, uh, but uh, I, I, I've heard, and I actually have tried myself, it's good. So there still will be coffee stations upstairs for Sunday school and here in the Java, and you'll notice that there's little collection boxes. All uh, of those are donation for BGMC. So all of that goes to BGMC. So all of our coffee uh, income goes to missions. And so we believe in missions, and we uh, are, are a church that stands behind missions and will support it any way that we can, even through coffee. So there you go. So. Stop by one of those places, that would be a great thing to do, and um, want to give a plug for year in giving. If, uh, if you haven't realized, today is the 18th of December. That means there's only one Sunday left in this year, so thank you for being faithful in giving. If you're going to be gone over the holidays, remember you can always give online. Thank you for doing so. We always want to remind you because we feel like we're, we're not doing a good job if we don't uh, remind you that God comes first, his tithe, first fruits go to him. There is blessing beyond what you can even imagine when you honor God with your, your first fruits, when you honor him with the tithe. That comes first before anything. And so we just want to remind you, and, and this, is what, this is what the Bible says in the book of Malachi, test me in this and see if I won't pour out blessing so much so that there's not room enough to receive it. That's what he, that is in relationship to the tithe. So honor God. Thank you for being faithful. You're an amazing church. Do an um, amazing job of ministering to other people, being faithful to God, to his house, and giving. Thank you so much for that. Um, Christmas Eve service this week. So I know you heard this announcement, but if you are going to be gone over the weekend, Wednesday, this Wednesday, there's no classes on Wednesday. It's just Christmas Eve service on Wednesday night at 6.30. So if you're going to be gone for the weekend, you won't be here on Christmas Eve, you get a chance to be part of the Christmas Eve service. Same thing that's happening on Wednesday will happen on Christmas Eve day at 4 o'clock and 6. Now, one thing we haven't done for years is candlelight at Christmas Eve service. But we're bringing that back and we're doing candlelight this Christmas Eve service. It will be a very special time. We'll be concluding the service with Christmas carols and candlelight, and I know that you don't want to miss that. So if you can, come, bring your family, bring your friends. It will be a tremendous time. I should have told you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. I have got a short amount of time to get a lot said. How's that? Matthew chapter 1. At the end of the service, we're going to be praying for needs, and there are a lot of people that we are praying for, a lot of big needs, a lot of sickness. I got a text that Ivan and Sandy Strong are very, very sick and going to the hospital, so um, would, you, would you be praying for them? At the end, we're going to pray for needs. We're going to pray for people responding to Jesus, because the message this morning is about Jesus. It's Christmas, and so we're talking about Jesus this morning, and I just, I, I'm, I'm believing that there is just going to be an overwhelming response because honestly, our answer to everything that we face in life is Jesus. 
If you, have a, if you have a problem, Jesus is the answer. If you have a need of any kind, Jesus is the answer. Jesus. You shall name him Jesus is what the angel told Joseph in this passage, Matthew chapter 1. This is the same passage that I read two Sundays ago when I preached in this service. And we talked about Emmanuel, God with us. But today I want to talk about Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 starting at verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, she was still a virgin. She became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. This is the Christmas story. It speaks about the purpose and the meaning of Christmas. It speaks about the purpose and the meaning of Jesus. I think most of us in the room, most of us joining online, welcome to all of you who are joining online today as well, would be um, surprised at the amount of people that couldn't tell you what the meaning of Christmas is. We live in a post-Christian uh, culture, and I think that most people in our world would say that Christmas is a winter holiday where you give gifts. Would you say that's true? Yet we listen to Christmas music throughout the season. I have for years listened to a secular radio station at Christmas time because they play Christmas music from Thanksgiving until Christmas. On 104.1, they play all kinds of Christmas music. And I hear all the Christmas hymns, all the Christmas carols. Hark the herald the angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. The message is there. But you're also listening to Santa Baby. I saw mama kissing Santa Claus. Rock around the Christmas tree. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. But the purpose and the meaning of Christmas, the angel spoke of that purpose when he told Jesus, you shall call, he told Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means savior, deliverer. We've been in a series in Genesis this fall, and we've seen that God had a plan and a design for his creation. Adam and Eve were the crown jewel of creation, and they were created in the image of God. And God created them for relationship. He created them for fellowship with himself. And he gave Adam and Eve dominion over the earth and placed them as the overseer of all creation. They were placed in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden. It was like heaven on earth. I wonder if you can imagine for just a moment what it would be like to live in a perfect place where it was never too hot or too cold. Temperature was never even a thought where there was no shortage of anything, only the best of everything, all of creation existing in harmony, everyone loving one another in a perfect way, a place where there's no sickness, no disease, no death, no worries, no care, because Jesus, you have the total assurance that he is gonna provide everything that you need. Try to imagine what a perfect place would be like. I don't know if you can, but this is what God had in mind for his creation in Eden. That's what he has in mind for us in our future in heaven. But sin entered the picture. And man fell hard. Everything became corrupted. 
Adam was created with a free will to decide between right and wrong, but when sin came into the picture, Adam was no longer free to make the decisions that he wanted to because he was operating out of a sinful heart. And we have the same condition where the thing that we want to do, we don't do. The thing that we don't want to do, it seems like that's the thing that we keep doing. Anybody relate to that statement? That's sin and sin's effect on our life. When sin came into the picture, it changed everything. Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death and death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. Immediately, Adam and Eve When they sinned, they became bent on making bad decisions. Immediately, they hid themselves instead of seeking out God. Immediately, they began to make excuses instead of honestly confessing their sin to God. So sin broke this relationship with God and with each other. Mankind lost so much and fell so far when sin entered the human race. In doing so, They traded righteousness for corruption. They traded a relationship with God for rebellion. They traded a perfect environment for one with pain and suffering and toil and death. They traded eternal life for eternal punishment. I think if Adam and Eve could have gone back and said, you know, if one bite of that fruit would have changed this, I would go back and not do it again. It changed everything. But John 3 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. We're talking today about the name of Jesus. The angel told Joseph, you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. There's something about the name Jesus. It's a name that's above all other names. The name Jesus is mentioned 600 times in the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 300 times in just the book of John. 900 times throughout the New Testament. Third John is the only book that doesn't mention specifically the name of Jesus. But the name Jesus, Jesus, in, is the Greek. The Hebrew name is Joshua or Yeshua. The full name is Jehoshua, which means Jehovah saves. When naming the baby, God was saying that he would save his people through him because that was the mission of Jesus, to save people from their sins. He was Jehovah, Jehoshua, the one who saves his people. He came to set us free from our sin, to deliver us from the dominion of the devil. Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to the temple and dedicated him on the eighth day and they had him circumcised. And there was a man, the scripture says, named Simeon that was there at the temple. And the scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so Joseph and Mary are there at the temple and Simeon comes and takes the baby takes him into his arms, and it says that he prays God. And this is what he said, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. Jesus was Messiah, the Savior. It's what the angel told Joseph. Call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. It's the same thing he told Mary in Luke chapter 1. Pastor um, Brian alluded to something back in Isaiah, but listen to what he, told, what he told Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a son you will call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. It sounds like what Pastor Brian was referring to in Isaiah chapter 9 which is 700 years before Jesus comes. Isaiah is prophesying about Messiah, and he said, a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. 
He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. There's no other name like the name Jesus. There's no other name, the Bible says, given under heaven whereby we can be saved. No name. Acts 10, 43 says, he is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. First Timothy 2 says, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. Of all the problems that mankind has faced through the ages, there's been no greater problem than that of sin. And we see sin has been around for a long time, but we see sin rampant in our world. Actually, all the problems that we face go back to this original sin. Sin destroys a relationship with God. It has an awful effect on our relationship with God. Why do we struggle so much to walk close in a relationship with God? Isaiah said this in Isaiah 59, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you when you call. Listen, he can and will save you, and there is nothing that he cannot save you out of. He will hear you when you call in his name, and there's nothing that can keep him from hearing when you call his name. When you call the name Jesus, he's there. But listen to what he says in verse 2, Isaiah 59. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. He's not too weak to save you, and his ear is not too deaf to hear you, but it's your sin that has cut you off from God. Sin separates us from God. Sin destroys our relationship with God, and it destroys our relationship with others. How many of you today would be honest and say you're currently in a relationship with a friend or with a family member that's strained? Anybody? Just raise your hand. Because here's what, we're, we're gonna pray at the end and we're gonna ask God to heal lives, relationships, families, marriages, relationships between parents and children. How many of you have a strained relationship? This is not anything to be ashamed of. It's, it's the effect of the world that we live in. We'd love to see those relationships. God, how can you save my relationship? Here's what, I, here's what I can tell you. With God, all things are possible. He said, what is impossible for man, everything is possible with God. Sin destroys our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and it even messes up our relationship with ourselves. There are a lot of people who think way too highly of themselves. You know who I'm talking about. There are people who think way too lowly of themselves. And the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy, and he'll put any kind of thought, any kind of idea in your mind to tell you about this person or that person or even about yourself. You've heard this message from, from, from the enemy before. You're not good enough. You might as well just throw in the towel. You're not good enough God, you're, for God to do that for you. He might do that for others, but he did not do that for you. It destroys our relationship with ourselves, sin is like a sinkhole. I've read some stories recently about neighborhoods across the, the, the nation where neighborhoods are built on an old mine or are built on an old, uh, traf uh, what do you call it, a uh, landfill. And years later, they start seeing sinkholes. And I, I've read stories about a sinkhole opening up and swallowing vehicles, opening up and swallowing homes, and homes just falling into a hole. It's, it's really the effect that sin has on our life. It's amazing how it can just engulf you and capture you, and all of a sudden, just you, it's got you. Sin is a problem. But Jesus, Jesus came to save his people from their sin. Jesus is the fulfillment of the answer that you need for sin. It's Jesus. Jesus had a miraculous birth. He was born of a virgin. Do you know anybody else? It was prophesied about him hundreds of years before. You remember Mary's response to the angel when, when, when he was saying, you will have a child and you will call his name Jesus. And, and she said, how can this be? She's just a young girl and her, her response is, I, I've never been with a man. 
isn't that a requirement to have a child? She was a virgin. It was a miraculous birth. He was the fulfillment of the answer for sin. He was the fulfillment because he lived a sinless life. Listen to all these scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 1 Peter 2, 22. He never sinned, nor did he deceive anyone. 1 John 3, 5. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him. He was perfect, sinless. He was the perfect sacrifice. The once and for all sacrifice, never to be another sacrifice. He fulfilled that with his substitutionary death. 1 Peter 2, 24, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. This is Christmas The message is Jesus. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We need salvation. You need salvation. I need salvation. Every day I need his salvation. The free gift that Jesus gives to us, what he offers us is forgiveness of sins. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go through anything. He's done it all for me. You don't have to go through anything. He's done it all for you. He took your place. And he offers you a free gift of salvation. You and everyone in your family. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a a parable that I love in the Bible. It's a parable of the unmerciful servant. If you want to read this, it's in Matthew chapter 18. And I know this parable is about forgiveness. And it's a message that comes very, very, very clear that we are to forgive because we've been forgiven. And I wanna read this this parable to you and I wanna make a couple of comments and then we're gonna pray here at the end. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? Up to seven times and Jesus said to him, I don't say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. Some of your versions say 70 times seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his master commanded that he be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment be made. Can you imagine Owing a debt so great, you couldn't pay. And so you and your spouse and your family were all made to be slaves until you could pay off this debt. It says that the slave fell to the ground. He prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the master of that slave felt compassion and he released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a 100 denarii and seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground, and he began to plead with him, saying, have patience on me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw this man into prison until he would pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that had happened. And summoning him, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. It's definitely a a story of forgiveness. We have been forgiven so much. God in his mercy and his love forgave a debt for you and for me that there's no way that we could repay. 
And so while this story of forgiveness and our response to God's forgiveness to us is great, I, I want to focus just for a minute on the debt. And some of you have heard me teach on this before, but I think the gravity of the scenario and the situation here of what's really going on is, is what makes the point of this, of this uh, parable. It says that this servant owed his master 10,000 talents. It's translated differently in a lot of different translations, but a talent is not a measurement that we use these days. And if you don't know how much a talent is, I'll, I'll tell you, you can follow your notes and you can read this to be true, that a talent is worth about 20 years wage. So if you t do the math and figure out how much this servant owed his master, 20 years equals one talent. How many talents did he owe his master? 10,000. So if you do the math, he owed his master 200,000 years worth of wages. 200,000. Do you think that's a debt? That's, I have no idea how this servant owed his master 200,000 years worth of wages. If you had been working from the time Jesus came to earth until now, there's 2,000 years. Now you've got 198,000 more years worth of working to pay this debt. Does that seem like an astronomical debt? And I think the point of this story is there is no way, there is no way we could ever pay the price for our forgiveness. There is no way that we could ever pay the price of the debt of our sin. Sin is a problem. Sin gets in the way. But Jesus made a way. You will call his name what? Jesus. Why? Because he'll save his people from their from their sin. How many of us need a savior? We need Jesus. Only Jesus. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. We only need Jesus. Listen, there's no way out of this earth that you're gonna have any hope except through Jesus. There's no way through this life that you will have hope day after day after day except Jesus. Jesus came to save his people. Sin destroys, sin corrupts, sin hurts, sin divides. Sin will ruin and rot your life. And the effects of sin are all around us but I'm thankful for Jesus. We need Jesus. We need Christmas. Not just today, not just this week. Every day of our lives, we need Jesus. How many of you today, in your life, in your circumstances, in your situation, you need Jesus? You know that Jesus is the only answer Jesus is the only answer for your life. Listen, heaven is what we should be talking about on Christmas. God designed man to live in a perfect place, the Garden of Eden, but sin came in and corrupted and destroyed it all. He had in mind for us to live in a perfect place. He promises a perfect place for eternity for all of us. I'm going there. How many of you want to go to heaven? How do we go to heaven? How do we go to heaven? Jesus. Do you want your kids to go to heaven? Jesus. Your family need Jesus. We need Jesus. We live in a world that doesn't want to talk about sin. The effects of sin. Think we can do whatever we want to do, live however we want to, it'll be fine. I got Jesus in my back pocket. We need to live with Jesus right out in front. With our eyes on Jesus, 
the enemy will do everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy, to get you off course, to, to destroy your family. He'll needle and noodle into every little corner of your life and your family that he can. We need Jesus. Would you bow your heads across the room with me and just I want you to be honest today. What, Jesus, what are you speaking to me? Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me today? How do you want me to respond? Listen, there should be nothing that keeps you from Jesus. Especially in this room today, the Holy Spirit is here and he's speaking into hearts and lives and he wants to change your circumstances. He wants to change your life. He wants to change your family. He wants to change your trajectory. He wants to change the course of your life. He wants heaven for you. He wants his best for you. Will you respond to him today? Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Is there anyone here in the room today you're not in a relationship with Jesus? Or maybe your words say that you are, and maybe just your, your actions by showing up at church says, yeah, I, I think everybody thinks I'm a Christian, but I know that I've not been walking with Jesus like I should. And today you're saying, Pastor Jeff, today I'm making a decision for Jesus. I don't care how long you have professed to be a Christian. Today, you're just saying again, I need you, Jesus. All across the room, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Jesus, I need you. Save me. Save me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. How many of you say, I need Jesus in my family? I've got family siblings, children, parents, grandparents, extended family that need Jesus. And we're getting ready to go into some family season where we're going to spend some time and it's difficult and I need Jesus in my family. How many across the room would say there's someone in your family that needs Jesus? Would you stand with me this morning? I don't want you to miss an opportunity today to receive what Jesus has for you. And if you're online today, will you just right where you are, if you need him, just stand up, raise your hands as we worship the Lord. But I wanna invite you to come across this altar this morning. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for people. I want people who are part of a prayer team to come. Or if you feel led to pray with someone, I want you to feel free to come and stand and pray with someone today. But would you come, all of you have needs today. Let's not leave this place without having an encounter with Jesus.